All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's programming, uh, Turning Wasted Heat into a Resource. I'm Caitlin Logston, the Programs Coordinator at Urban Green, and I'll be providing technical support for today's episode, our program. Uh, you can submit your questions via the questions box, which I'll be monitoring throughout today's discussion, and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible during the second half of today's program. And if you experience any audio or video issues during the course, please send me an email at kl at urbangreencouncil.org. Um, we're also recording this session, so um, we'll make sure that that's available to you after the program. Um, I'd also like to thank today's event sponsor, Con Edison, for supporting Urban Green Council. Uh, before we begin today's program, I have Robert Perez, manager of the commercial and industrial programs at Con Ed, who will be sharing a few slides with us about some of their active programs. Good morning, everyone. Uh, th thank you for the introduction, Caitlin. As, as she said, my name is Robert Perez. I'm a manager with the commercial industrial program. Today, I'm, I'm here to speak to you a little bit about uh, Con Edison and what they're doing for clean heat, as well as some of the New York State uh, clean heat program. Next slide. So um, the, the the New York State Clean Heat Program uh, is is really gearing up for clean heat. It's very excited about it. They're look they're they're um, providing cash incentives for the installation of electric clean heat systems. Uh, some important notes um, to take down about these systems to participate in this program is that the systems must be satisfied to, to uh, must be satisfied for your uh, your space heating and or hot water heating load. So if you're just going to change out one VRF unit or one you know uh, a heat pump or something in that nature, that would go through a normal program such as the commercial uh, the kind of commercial CNI program. Uh, this is really for like a whole building heating system. Um, for in, in New York City, you must be a an existing Con Edison electric customer. Unfortunately, NIPA customers are not eligible for this program. Um, any heating existing heating fuel source is acceptable. So it could be natural gas, it could be oil, it could be steam. Um, we're really open to anyone, like I said, who has an who, who's an electric customer. Um, and then the clean heat system must be submitted by a New York State clean heat participating contractor. This could be a designer or an installer. So some of the different categories for heat pump technologies that, that we're covering are, are uh, uh, variable refrigerant flow um, units, or better known as VRFs, central air source units, water heating solutions, ductless mini splits, and geothermal, and, and custom heat pump solutions. Uh, one nice thing to, to note is that we are, we are covering, Con Edison is covering up to $150 per MMBTU. Um, for projects, for some of you that are familiar with our program, um, we typically, the highest we ever give out for, um, uh, for, for uh, energy efficiency projects is about $7 a therm. This is about double that if you do the conversions. And we will cover up to roughly 70% of the project. Now, this goes project by project, case by case. But, you know, if you have a project that you're, you're interested in, um, you think it might, may, may fit some of, our, some of what, we're, what we're presenting, you know, reach out to one of us. Next slide. So a couple of different re, uh, resources for clean heat that I think would be useful to everyone. Um, once we once we give out this presentation, there's links so you could just uh, follow through here. You can visit uh, Clean Heat NYSERDA uh, for a lot of information on the clean heat program. You can find a qualified contractor. And for any inquiries about um, any of our programs um, for Con Edison, you could email cleanheat at coned.com. This is a new program, so we're sorry, but we do not yet have all of our websites up and running yet. We're hoping to have them um, live where you can get more information and so on and so forth. Uh, hopefully after Thanksgiving, may, but realistically probably towards the, 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 the beginning to middle of December. And aside from this, I have one more slide. So then just aside from this, for, for those of you that work on clean heat and different, different sorts of technologies, um, please you know, make sure you visit uh, coned.com slash commercial or, or multifamily for all the different programs that we have. These are a lot of resources and and uh, links to all of our programs. And that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Robert. Um, and then with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to today's moderator, um, Rebecca Kraft, uh, Director of Sustainability Electrification at Sidewalk Labs, who's going to introduce herself and um, get us started with today's discussion. Oop, you're on mute, Rebecca. Yep, I always do that. Sorry about that. Hi, uh, welcome. I want to welcome everybody to this. It's um, it's going to be a, a, a very a pretty technical panel, but also a very exciting panel. Uh, I'm Rebecca Kraft. Uh, you can see my title 
uh, specifically at Sidewalk Labs, I work on affordable electrification. So electrification of buildings, among other things. And, um, and you know, the, the case studies you're gonna hear today are what we think, at least at Sidewalk Labs, are how the world has to move in the future. So, so why do I say exciting? Um, let's put some context around heat recovery and heat pumps. For those who, of us who think global warming is real, it, it pre represents a, and it presents really an existential crisis, but not a crisis that does not have solutions. Decarbing, decarbonizing the energy supply is one of those solutions. And the current most plausible path to uh, radical decarbonization is to electrify transportation, industry, and buildings, and to simultaneously green the power grid. In the US, this action could reduce carbon emissions by 75% by 2050. And of the three sectors, bu buildings can be uh, electrified both uh, most fully and most economically. And buildings are important because they generate nearly 40% of glo annual global greenhouse gas emissions. That's true in the US as well. And in cities, that percentage rises to 70%. And what we have to remember is that approximately two thirds of the building area that exists today is still going to be here in 2050. So reducing carbon emissions from buildings is absolutely key. You know, using alternatives to fossil fuels for space conditioning and hot water can make a huge dent in these emissions. Alternatives from traditional geothermal energy to building waste heat to sewer recovery, sewer waste heat recovery. And that's what we're gonna hear about today, these alternatives. The case studies that our panelists will present show how technologies that are not necessarily brand new, heat pumps, electric boilers, converting steam to hot water, can be used more effectively than ever in buildings, both new and existing buildings, and to really remarkable ends, reductions in energy use, 25, 30%, lower costs, improvements in labor productivity, massive improvements in efficiency. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists, Jeff Erlab, Michael Gordon, John Reiner, Daniel Nall, who will introduce themselves. And, uh, and just so sort of generally speaking, we're gonna to move to a sort of large scale applications, smaller scale applications. Uh, I want to repeat what Caitlin said earlier. Uh, please put your questions into the Q&A box and not into the chat. And so uh, Jeff is up first and he's going to give us a, a, a campus view, how a, a conversion of, of a number of pieces of a campus uh, produce amazing results. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it to Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Rebecca. Again, Jeff Furlob, Sal O'Brien uh, Company. And I've been uh, designing, you know, heat pump applications for over 20 years now. So we started out doing buildings and now we're into a large scale, complete campus conversions, um, corporate campus, higher education campus, it doesn't matter, more than one building. If we connect them, we're on a campus loop. I'd like to start out on Miami University's little bit of background. So Amy, I got engaged with Miami University back in 2010 to look at a master plan. How can we convert our campus using all electric heat pumps to heat and cool our campus? Photo on the left is a new, we call it a geothermal energy plant, a GEP, not a CEP, because it uses 100% ground loop heat exchangers to provide the energy source to heat and cool the Western campus. The neat thing on the right photo is we drilled 600 foot vertical heat exchangers below this uh, three acre pond. And the neat thing about this is we use the, this pond, which is also their retention pond and irrigation water for the campus, um, as a load balancer for our ground loop heat exchanger. Next. A little background about Miami. Um, there's about 19,500 students on their campus, plus you got all the faculty and, and the staff. So it's a lot of population in this area. We got 2,500 acres of grounds, but the main point here is 8 million square feet of buildings that will be converted off of steam using a low water temperature when they're all done with their conversion. Next. During the master plan, Miami wanted to do a whole paradigm shift. Why should we do this? And here are the KIPs that we laid out on why should they do this? Uh, customer focus, their res halls were either heat or cool. You cannot do uh, heating or cooling in a certain season. 
And that was a comfort issue with a, a lot of their uh, residents. Safety, they had steam injuries. And then you got your productivity. Um, we can get much better COP. We have carbon reduction and a KDBTU per gross square foot reduction. And then of course, the cost. Next. So we put together the master plan in 20, started that in 2010. We started implementing the master plan in 2012. The Western campus was converted over using a low water temperature and the steam was reduced, uh, removed. And we developed the GEP facility. And as of today, we're in the South Quad is actually just being finished up on a conversion. And I will show you a map here in a minute to give you the scale of all this. But they have a plan through 2026 to be converted off of steam to a water-based system. Next. Some of the unexpected outcomes. Caitlin, next. There we go. Some of the you know, expected outcomes to do this paradigm shift were really the re redundancy. They wanted year-round cooling and heating available. Uh, they wanted to make sure their customers were happy with their temperatures in their spaces and, and aesthetically pleasing. They removed all the outdoor air-cooled condensing units throughout the campus. They removed any outdoor equipment that was used for heating or cooling. Uh, it really made the, the campus much more pleasant, quieter, safety, like I mentioned before, productivity, and then the cost. Uh, they wanted to reduce their water, reduce chemicals that they're using in their cooling towers and, and steam systems, and then less environmental regulations. They no longer have a stack permit for their boilers, and then flexibility with their fuel sourcing. When you look at 2010, when we started master planning, here was their campus. It was all steam. And now you can see what the master plan is next. By 2026, um, this is how their campus is gonna look. It won't be completely off of a higher water temperature. The red buildings will be still on a, a higher water temperature and that will be served from the old steam plant. But the green down in the bottom is gonna be, that's already all geothermal. The north uh, area, that's already all converted to a hot water based system using 130 degree water. The next step there is to install more heat pumps and then also a ground loop heat exchanger. And the south quad is, is just getting finished up being converted off of steam to a low water temperature. So you can see that they're progressing nicely with the master plan and getting this campus converted over. Now we'll actually talk a little more in detail about the project. So implementing the first phase, um, when, we, when they master plan the Western campus, they are going to build uh, four new facilities in the Western campus. One was going to be the dining and then three res halls and then our GEP plant. And then we converted uh, four more buildings and then a total remodel on Clawson. Um, one thing to note here is the, when we convert a building, we also take the hot water for the, like these res halls for the domestic water. We heat 100% of the domestic water with our central 130 degree loop. And it's instantaneous. We do not actually use water storage or anything like that. We're very careful on the Legionella. And this has been perfected over time. And uh, it took us a while to make sure we could actually meet the demand of the domestic water load when 500 students in one res hall are taking showers. Now, when we look at the efficiencies, the, the KIPs of uh, the actual performance. So they've been measuring um, all their energy inputs and the usage around the campus. Next. And the neat thing about that is we, we have the actual load profile from our geothermal energy plant. When, she, when we started out the conversation, we talked about simultaneous heating and cooling. You can see that band in the middle that's our simultaneous heating and cooling throughout the whole year. Well, that gives us our largest COP, correct? Like a seven. Um, so 
that's a really, when you look at a campus setting, there's always heating and cooling going on in a large campus setting. And we can take care, we can get the highest COP out of our heat pumps at that moment. Next. When you look at the efficiencies, when we first started this campus, we used a, their 2008 baseline. Um, we reduced their carbon already by 56% and we're not even done um, converting their campus. 52% reduction in EUI. And then how about this? $8.9 million in an annual savings um, in 2019. And then $200,000 in chemical savings. And we also are saving maintenance, FTEs for labor and water and sewer. And there's a lot of other savings that goes into this. But um, that was not been all tabulated, but you can see the large energy savings by going from a steam system to a low water temperature based heating and cooling system. And thank you, that's, look forward to uh, questions later. Great, thank you, Jeff. And, and so now uh, Mike, Michael Gordon is gonna uh, take us who, from United, Pipe, who's a pipe training trades training specialist from uh, UA is uh, going to talk a little bit about uh, how to convert from traditional technologies to heat pumps. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and present uh, and give you a little bit of an idea of not just the UA, but what some of the things are that are happening in Canada. Uh, I'm going to go over, uh, you know, government initiatives that are supporting change. And then I'm going to just get into a few examples, some of them doing a comparison and then a quick uh, couple uh, retrofit examples that can be researched online at your discretion, or you can feel free to reach out to me at your convenience. So United Association in Canada, we have 355,000 members across North America. These are pipe trades professionals. That is the core uh, listing of trades that impact um, space heating being one of the major energy uh, consumption vehicles and as well as uh, water, uh, domestic water heating is another uh, major element that consumes a lot of the energy. Uh, we pride ourselves on training. We pride ourselves on being the best trained in the business and setting the uh, uh, setting the mark for all to follow. Uh, and that helps not just us within the UA, but all competing um, organizations, be it non-union. We're very integral to uh, change and in, in, in fostering new technologies. So heat pumps and, and any type of efficiency vehicles at the uh, one of the key things of our focus. Let's go to the next slide. So our government has arranged a market transformation roadmap that's from here uh, to 2025 uh, uh, and, and beyond. Uh, our initial goals are to provide uh, input through an advisory council uh, and foster this change. Let's go to the next slide. They look at it as the five A's of market transformation. And if you look at this, it breaks down quite clearly the availability of the uh, technology, um, accessibility uh, within the marketplace for contractors, clients, and owners to be able to put this equipment to use, and, and not only for new installations, but retrofits, awareness of everybody uh, with the expertise to design, install, and service this equipment so that it works as it's intended to, uh, affordability. Uh, to install, to retrofit, to use it as an option and not to be reliant only on grants and other items to make this uh, as a usable solution all the way into the future. And then overall acceptance by all people involved. Next slide. Uh, example projects 
I'm just going to go over a few of those. Uh, supermarket application. There's two interesting um, um, applications here. The first one being supermarkets. We had two supermarkets, one running by conventional means where you had refrigeration and, and free, freezer units uh, removing heat and dumping it to atmosphere, uh, not being put to use, and then conventional heating systems uh, during the uh, uh, heating season being used to utilize energy, be it gas or oil or electrical uh, sources to be able to heat the space. Well, we have a particular supermarket where they're looking to, con uh, uh, to construct a new one. So what they did is they said, well, they're gonna take a different approach and they use heat pumps. They actually captured the heat from the freezers and the refrigerators. And then in, in turn, use that uh, in an in for radiant hydronic heating system to be able to heat the store. So now you're creating a Bit of a loop of the heat going out into the space uh, and then you know heat being removed from the fr uh, freezers and the refrigerators being cycled in that way but they found they had so much surplus they had ground source loops as part of this system that they were dumping the excess heat and they said look we've got so much happening here we can put this to use where they were formally salting the uh, parking lot of the supermarket they installed a snow melt system so instead of having that maintenance cost for um, uh, third parties to come in and salt and, and plow they instead had a much safer environment for client for customers to come through and they actually had all of the snow melted by the surplus heat and uh, they still had a surplus so the ground source loops were used and it was at the rear of their building it into the winter time was the one place where snow was consistently not to be found. So they decided to maximize this as an opportunity. They enclosed it as a greenhouse and they now have a year round greenhouse uh, at the rear end of this supermarket. So it's a good example of, you know, instead of using conventional means, how we can do things differently with a little bit of additional thought and, and, and strategy to make things uh, maximized. Um, a recreation comp. This was a retrofit. You had it was uh, in this conventional building. They had uh, skating rinks. They had pools. They have you know tracks and and uh, other meeting spaces. And uh, I'll, I'll stick to the ice rinks for a moment. The ice rinks where you're running systems, heat pumps to remove the heat. Uh, and keep the rink in a frozen state was being dumped to atmosphere and you had uh, gas fired tube heaters that were over the spectators uh, that would be watching the hockey uh, games and it, you know in turn delivering heat to the space and it was the one technology working against the other so they changed that what they did in, in its place is they instead decided to use these heat pumps and they retrofitted the stadium where they had in bench radiant hydronic loops that, that some of the heat was utilized to do direct heating to the person that would sit on the bench so all the spectators experienced a higher level of comfort and it wasn't working in conflict with the uh, maintenance of a frozen state of the ice rinks they also found they still had a major surplus so they were using this and they kept doing additional steps to the retrofit which included uh, adding heating to the pools and with uh, outside ground source loops being used primarily as a dumping point for the excess heat they decided to look at visiting providing additional btus to a neighboring industrial complex so they started to do that so uh, just again it shows changing our way of thinking there's all kinds of examples of how these things can be uh, improved they achieved cops in the range of seven within that recreational complex that are documented online let's go to the next slide I'll wrap it up with another example here. We had, uh, it was around the two to 400 uh, vertical borehole loop in the formerly known as the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, now known as Ontario Tech University. Um, this was a retrofit project. The building in of itself is a lead silver. Uh, they have conventional means of heating uh, throughout the building. We are a heating dominant geographical uh, location where this is, uh, where this campus is located. There were planning and building um, is if you can see by that image there it's an open field right in the middle of the campus and they intended to build 
these buildings all the way around. When they only had 70% of these buildings constructed, they had targeted that they were going to be able to achieve a return on investment of the retrofit in seven to 10 years. At only 70% of the buildings that would provide load uh, requirements, they were able to get that return on investment uh, by their records of three to four years. So imagine now that all of the buildings uh, have been constructed, even as a supplementary form of heating and cooling, um, this has achieved its goals far beyond what they had previously determined to be the case. So these are just a few examples of, of some of the things that are at play. Uh, that system was completed in 2003 with intended additional buildings to be constructed and was formerly the largest uh, um, system of its kind in North America. There's since been others uh, uh, provided, but we're open to the discussion uh, further on this and how we can help and I think how uh, we can take you know feathers out of the cap of either the United States or Canada and, and keeping this going forward. And thanks for the opportunity to speak to all of you. So ne next up, um, we have uh, John Reiner, who's going to take us through a great example of using energy from the earth uh, for uh, ground source heat pumps in a particularly, uh, what I imagine is a particularly diff difficult retrofit because it uh, was in the dense, you know, density of New York City. So John, I'm turning it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Reiner. Um, uh, I've been in the geothermal business in New York City for over 20 years. And I've had the opportunity to explore some of the, uh, uh, you know, rock conditions and the earth beneath the city. Believe it or not, there's a lot of uh, earth and uh, material beneath uh, the city, beneath the skyscrapers and the buildings. And um, unlike uh, Jeff and Mike, they were speaking about geothermal systems. Um, those tap into the natural uh, the temperatures in the earth. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is a phenomenon that I've observed through uh, drilling some deep geothermal wells in the city, then, and that's a, an unusual accumulation of um, uh, a lot of heat in the ground, and part of it is derived from um, you know, solar input from the, um, from the sun, and um, uh, the rest of it is from the, the um, uh, structures and infrastructure in the ground um, from, from man-made um, uh, activities. So next slide, please. So um, it all starts with the urban heat island effect. That's the main source of this accumulation of heat in the shallow ground. And um, we don't have to go into the urban heat island effect. I think everyone understands it, but the um, the idea is that that effect not only uh, impacts the air and the buildings around us in the city, but it also um, extends into the ground. So this is an interesting study that was done back in the 60s. Coincidentally, um, we had a drought um, in New York right about that time. I don't know if that's why they did this study, uh, but they actually uh, flew a helicopter from Westchester to Jersey, and they measured um, uh, profiled uh, air temperatures from the helicopter down to the surface. And <clears throat> what this shows is a uh, very high accumulation of heat in New York City, the upper um, right illustration. Those temperatures ranged from 72 to 86 down at the ground. And then over to the left in, in Westchester and the Bronx, the temperatures were, were significant and lower, 66 to 71. So it just shows the uh, influence of uh, this urban heat island effect. and um, that's in, in the middle of the summer, the one on the bottom right, that's in the winter, and it just shows the um, temperatures were higher in New York City uh, down at the bottom than the air. So you have this um, residual heat in the ground that's emanating back into the atmosphere. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, we have this accumulation of heat in the ground, and, and really I'm just informing and educating everyone of this this resource that's available that you may not have been aware of and i will be talking about one case study where they actually tapped into it so this is more of an educational informative presentation with with the case study so what are this what are the sources of this um i call it wasted heat um the stuff in the ground is it's not waste heat from any kind of mechanical process it's just 
heat that's a, a incidental byproduct of um, anthropogenic uh, structures in the ground that that could be recovered and it, it, it since it isn't it gets accumulated in the ground so the one natural source of this uh, shallow urban ground heat is the sun um, hitting the earth heating up the surface and then uh, by conduction being transferred into the ground some of the anthropogenic heat sources in the ground um, as you can imagine, all sorts of uh, utility mains, steam mains, sanitary pipes, sewage pipes, which are higher temperature. Um, they will, um, by conduction, uh, give off some of that heat into the ground. Underground structures, building basements, which are typically you know, not air conditioned and subway stations and transportation tunnels. All of these structures are not air conditioned. So any heat that's down there will, will uh, pass through the foundation structures into the earth um, and then some other along the shorelines and there, there's landfills in the city probably as a smaller source of this urban heat uh, landfilled areas and um, just filled in wetlands and shorelines um, that material is organic so it's going to decompose and give off heat over time uh, next slide please so just the natural, um, let's set the stage with the baseline, the natural ground temperature. Where, where do we, where, where does the, where do we get this uh, thermal energy in the ground? Um, you don't have to look at all the words, just the illustrations on the right. The one in the middle shows down to um, a depth of about 30 to 50 feet. Generally, the thermal energy in, in the ground, naturally speaking, comes from the sun. So it's really a solar uh, energy source, and you can see that the uh, uh, that illustration is the temperature with depth, and in the upper 30 to 50 feet, you have this this uh, seasonal swing in the temperature with depth. Um, not only is is some of that energy from the sun, but it's also um, surface temperatures are also influenced by the outdoor air temperature. So you have this natural swing back and forth seasonally with depth. And then at, at a depth of about 50 feet, um, that influence is no longer uh, felt. And fr from uh, that depth downwards, it's a generally consistent temperature until you get to about 600 feet or so. Um, and that's where the, the deep earth core temperature picks up. That's the maroon arrow in the bottom right. Um, the uh, core of the earth is constantly giving off heat um, and coming, radiating outwards towards the surface. So natural geothermal systems, those are the two sources of thermal energy that, that um, um, provide that temperature in the ground. Now on the right, um, that's a, a temperature profile that we ran in, in Chelsea that represents, um, again, that's vertical from the, from the top down, that's a 1500 foot uh, deep geothermal hole we drilled and we ran a temperature profile in the water and you can see the red plot that's the that's the temperature profile so it starts um, high up at the surface and it gradually decreases and where you see it, it inflects and starts to um, head off to the right again that's about 600 feet so that yellow arrow says the effect of the sun is about 50 feet but in Manhattan, um, I've seen it down in other places, generally down about 600 feet, the, the influence of the sun is felt. And below that, you see the temperature increase, that's a natural um, geothermal gradient. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to, these are a couple of observations we've made in Manhattan, this, this phenomenon of, of high temperatures in the shallow earth um, the one in the middle is, is in Midtown, and I know this a lot, I had to piece together a couple of graphs, but basically what this shows is near the surface, uh, the temperature was 72 degrees at a depth of 100 feet, and that's where we started our temperature profile. Uh, if you projected that up to the surface, it, it could have even been as high as 75 or, or, or greater in temperature, and then you see the uh, decrease with depth. Uh, down to its lowest temperature, about 56. So that's a lot of, that's a big thick zone of, of very warm, I'll say hot earth that is, is a resource and um, it could be derived from a number of, uh, of anthropogenic sources. Uh, on the right, that's, okay, yeah, we, can, we can keep going. <clears throat> so 
we have this resource is shallow earth heat. What are what are the possible uses and, and challenges of developing it? Well, uses um, the natural um, thought would be indoor space heating and domestic hot water production. And the case study I'll be presenting in a minute is one where they used it specifically for, for domestic hot water. The challenges, um, it's not a natural distribution of thermal energy. Uh, a lot of factors play into where you can find it and how depth and what are the what depths and what is the temperature so can it be um, predicted and how can it be harnessed cost effectively this is the case study and i have to qualify this i was not um this was not a project that i worked on i did speak with the the nycha um, project manager and the engineer that was involved on the project this case study can be um, viewed on nycha's uh, website uh, so it's a building in, in Manhattan, um, 28th Street, built in 71, 225 units serving 450 low and extremely low income residents. Uh, before the project, <clears throat> it used 28% more energy than typical New York City multifamily building. Uh, they had district steam heating, two separate systems for space heating and domestic hot water. And in 2012, um, NYCHA implemented a $2.2 million lighting, heating, and hot water modernization project, partially funded by the ARA funds as well as uh, NYCHA's capital fund. So what they decided to do was um, put in a geothermal closed loop system um, to serve the domestic hot water. And I understand uh, on the order of eight uh, geothermal loops were installed in the illustration you see in the bottom of the uh, the photograph, the aerial photograph you see in the bottom middle, that, that's a courtyard area. I, I imagine that's where they installed the, uh, the loops. Uh, they connected them to uh, two 20-ton uh, geothermal heat pumps and put in some new domestic hot water tanks. And the uh, intent was to use the ground to um, temper the water, bring it up to 80 to 90, and then the district steam would take it the rest of the way. So the savings, um, the results, um, Pretty amazing savings. When I spoke to them, they were very happy with it and, and really amazed at what uh, the cost savings and the energy savings were able to realize uh, with this project. 23% energy savings and 25% uh, cost savings on what district steam they did end up having to use for um, domestic hot water. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so we have this resource. And um, you know how can we how can we characterize this and potentially uh, develop it um, in a systematic manner? It's there for the for the for the taking. Um, it's not a new concept. There's been a lot of studies uh, internationally of how to tap into shallow geothermal energy, and this is one study that was was interesting, and they they tried to. Um, make a correlation between the land surface temperatures and the ground temperatures. Um, the, the problem was that uh, to try to, to measure ground temperatures, it, it takes um, installation of um, a lot of wells and boreholes and you know accessing that, that ground is expensive and you, you can't tell what the ground temperatures are from the surface. So they wanted to see if they could make the correlation between the land surface temperatures, which you can measure with satellite um, derived technology, and you can map that, um, see if they can relate that to the, the ground temperatures. So that was their objective. They looked at four German cities. Um, they, they actually measured the land surface temperatures using satellites, and they had a whole slew of wells in the ground. So they, they mapped out the ground temperatures and they, and they compared the two. And, um, Normally, um, if you'll talk to any geothermal consultant, if they, if someone asks them what's what's my ground temperature, it's generally the um, the, the mean ground temperature is equivalent to the mean uh, outdoor air temperature at, at any one location. So um, that's what they that that's the baseline that they compared uh, their findings from, and they saw a variance. And let's go on the next slide, please. And the variance basically was, in most cases, the ground temperatures on average were one and a half times warmer than the land surface temperatures. So that kind of demonstrated that 
there's a lot of heat in the ground and residual heat and and uh, it, it, it varies from the normal um, theory that the ground temperatures would be equivalent to the outdoor air temperatures. And they attribute that to the uh, subsurface anthropogenic heat sources. Some of the important ones they identified were um, sewage systems, sewage leakage. Um, in Europe, there's a lot of district heating networks. There's a lot of sharing of heating going on in European cities, um, unlike the US, and I think that's a direction we need to head towards and we are heading towards that, as well as subway systems. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, there's a lot of heat in the ground, um, in the shallow ground under urban city, including Manhattan. Um, the outer boroughs, it may not be as um, uh, large uh, resource or accumulation of heat as Manhattan, but certainly uh, large buildings and concrete and asphalt, uh, where you have the heat island effect is the greatest. You'll see that effect translated into the ground. Um, perhaps uh, we could take a, do a similar study that they did um, with the German cities and elsewhere to try to uh, make some correlations and perhaps map out that that heat. And uh, it's a, a concept called a heat map that um, you know online. Uh, web-based models are pretty popular um, in Europe and that's where a developer could look at this and, and identify areas where uh, they could potentially tap into this. So a couple of uh, words of warning for um, geothermal systems in the city. Um, the NYCHA building, I have to say it was for domestic hot water and um, I have to wonder how well it's working now because these types of systems typically use them for heating and cooling. So you don't pull too much heat out of the ground or dump too much heat in. Um, so they're not typically used for a two way uh, heating and cooling process. Um, so if you are considering that, it should be uh, uh, thought out carefully with geothermal folks and supported by detailed modeling. And of course, temp actually, um, measuring the temperature on the ground. Um, what else can I say? Up and coming applications, I just want to put in a plug. There's um, some technologies out there that are, are being um, studied and, and implemented now to actually tap into that shallow ground heat and heat exchange with wastewater. I think Rebecca mentioned that. That is certainly an up and coming uh, technology. And I believe that could be a subject of a future urban green um, um, panel presentation and heat exchange from city water piping network. Anything that has heat in it that's, that's just uh, being wasted uh, could be recovered. Thank you. Thank you, John. That's great. Thank you, John. So um, our, last, our last speaker is um, Daniel Nall, and he's going to talk about a building in particular rather than a group of buildings. You know, buildings generate all sorts of heat throughout the day. Heat comes from equipment and appliances like computers and television screens. And so Daniel's going to speak to an example, give us an example of how, uh, how a great building uh, harnessed that heat. So Daniel, it's all yours. Good morning. So I'm going to talk this morning about uh, a project that I did a few years ago uh, with Pelle Clark, Pelle Architects um, in Buenos Aires. Um, the Banco Macro Headquarters. Next slide. Here's some images, uh, some of them rendered, some of them uh, um, um, uh, actually real. The, you have an image there of uh, uh, Caesar walking the, uh, the uh, promenade of the, uh, uh, of the building while it was under construction. Next slide. <clears throat> so, the issues with this building, it was uh, on an urban site uh, with setbacks and thus had a very small floor plate uh, available. It was under a, um, an airport flight path, so it had a height limitation and the, um, and the uh, owner wanted to maximize the usable floor area on the site as, as always. The base case uh, HVAC system were was an overhead VAV with uh, air handling units per floor and electric resistance heat. There was no gas available at the site. 
Um, because of the, the physical constraints of the site, uh, we were not able to implement uh, any kind of free cooling. Uh, we could not implement air side economizer, and unfortunately, it just doesn't get cold enough in Buenos Aires to implement water side economizer. The client had some very significant uh, uh, energy efficiency and lead aspirations. And so we were going to be stuck with comparing our building against the building that uh, utilized uh, free cooling. The climate of Buenos Aires is sort of uh, a little more extreme than, uh, than uh, um, the coast of California, maybe a little north of Los Angeles. It gets a little warmer. It's a little more humid. The design heating temperature is about zero Celsius, freezing, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So we were really pulling our hair out, figuring out how we were going to get an energy efficient building with these constraints in what is really a very mild climate. <clears throat> so what we identified is instead of doing free cooling, we were going to try to do free heating, as it were. So um, the analysis of the climate showed that the design heating temperature, zero degrees Celsius, that's freezing, 32 Fahrenheit. We knew that peak heating occurs on a morning after a clear night, because if you're familiar with environmental physics, you know that the, uh, on a clear night, the uh, atmosphere is uh, very transparent, uh, a long wave uh, infrared radiation uh, lost by the surface. And so um, your coldest temperatures occur after a clear night. We also know that a clear night likely follows a sunny day. I mean, it's not uh, uh, 100%, but when you're doing energy efficiency as opposed to engineering design, most of the time is good enough. So a uh, clear night uh, likely follows a sunny day, and the temperature uh, on that sunny day likely rose to, you know, perhaps as high as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. There'd be a lot of solar heat gain in the building. And so the building was likely in a cooling mode on the previous day. So we're rejecting heat into the atmosphere on the previous day, and yet we need heat for morning warm up on the following morning. So our strategy that we identified was we were required to have in this building a 277 cubic meter fire protection water storage tank because of the inadequacy of the water service industry uh, to serve our um, stand pipes and sprinkler systems. Uh, this is, excuse me, 75,000 gallons of water. It's a number some of you are design engineers may be familiar with. It's a fairly common uh, size for a uh, major fire protection water storage tank. By the way, it weighs 600,000 pounds. So our strategy then was to, what we thought we could do is to take the heat that's being rejected on the warm summer afternoon with sun, store it in the fire protection water storage tank, and then use it for makeup the following morning. Um, the, uh, there's some results of, of using this strategy. Um, the hours of use of the boiler were reduced from 30 to 60, and, and the size of the boiler was reduced. So here's what we have for an HVAC system. We have water source, variable refrigerant flow, multi-split heat pumps. Uh, that these uh, multi-split systems have a uh, refrigerant side heat recovery, so that uh, basically if the perimeter of the building is in uh, a cooling mode, it can take that heat that it's uh, recovering from the perimeter Excuse me, if it, I said that backwards, pardon me. If the interior of the building is in cooling mode, we can take the heat uh, that is recovered from the interior and take it out to the perimeter to meet the heating load. But also, if there's an imbalance such that the, uh, there's uh, more cooling load, we are rejecting heat into the tempered water loop, and then we uh, use that to heat up the, uh, the, the fire protection water storage tank to store the heat for use later. We have a dedicated outdoor air ventilation system with enthalpy recovery wheels. We have a small electric uh, boiler on the temporal water loop. And then we have a very large electric boiler that is connected to the standby generator for coal startup. There is a connected charge for the utility um, such that if this three megawatt electric boiler were connected uh, directly to the utility, there would be a monthly charge for having that connected load. Next slide. 
So here's what the floor plate looks like. Uh, the mechanical room for the uh, <coughs> compressorized unit for the water storage heat pump, much smaller than the, uh, the mechanical room for a central station air handling unit. Um, also, the floor to floor height is reduced because we don't have a lot of overhead ducting, just a little bit of ducting for outdoor air systems and refrigerant piping <coughs> going from the compressorized unit to the fan coils on the floor. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a riser diagram for the, uh, um, the building, and you can see uh, the uh, cooling tower on the roof for rejecting the heat. You can see the um, dedicated outdoor air handling unit uh, at the top of the building for the ventilation air. Uh, you can see at the bottom the uh, fire protection water storage tank in red and the heat exchanger between that uh, uh, fire protection water storage tank uh, and the circulating loop and the electric boilers. So we have VRF heat pump indoor units uh, on each floor with a single tempered uh, water loop. All the cooling units, including, including the server rooms, are cooled by the tempered uh, water loop. Uh, the strategy is to provide all building heating with recovered heat. <clears throat> the thermal storage uh, retains the heat overnight and the energy savings is approximately 30% with all measures. Now the process of getting the fire marshal in Buenos Aires uh, to approve using the fire protection water storage uh, system for thermal storage uh, was uh, very onerous. I wrote a 25 some odd page paper citing NFPA 13, NFPA 14, and NFPA 22 uh, to um, show that this is allowed uh, in the NFP standard, NFPA standards. And also, um, we had to include some details on the piping of the, of the tank that would absolutely totally prevent the, uh, the circulation pump to the heat exchanger ever from uh, draining the fire protection water storage tank below the level required for fire protection. Next slide. So here are some of the results. You can see that there's a, a massive reduction uh, in space heating over there on the slide on the, uh, on the left uh, and significant uh, energy savings. I will have to say that uh, uh, with the exception of uh, a little bit of daylight responsive lighting controls, uh, much of the building in the baseline case was similar to the, uh, to the proposed design case in the lead study. The building envelope uh, was uh, not any better than, than, than uh, a code minimum. Uh, the lighting design uh, had a lot of decorative lighting and so on and so forth. So most of these savings are coming from the HVAC system. And much of that is, uh, uh, is, is due to the thermal storage of, of not having to uh, provide makeup heat. The major problem with water source heat pumps is that particularly in any occupancy where all the, the uh, uh, spaces are in, in heating mode at the same time is that the, the compressorized units are drawing heat from the circulating loop and uh, that loop has very little mass, and so very shortly, you have to start adding heat to the loop. So basically, you're buying the heat twice. You buy the electricity for the compressor to extract the heat from the circulating loop to put in the space, and then you have to buy the heat to put into the circulating loop. So what we've done with this thermal storage system was to get rid of most of the supplemental heat that would uh, uh, make up for the fact that all the spaces were drawing heat from the circulating loop at the same time. Next slide. So I want to thank uh, uh, Pelly Clark Pelly for having the opportunity to work on this project. And uh, at the time uh, that I worked on this project, that I was a principal in charge uh, for Flack and Kurtz, WSB Flack and Kurtz in New York. Thank you. Great, thank you. I know we only have a couple minutes here, um, but if all the panelists want to turn on their cameras and mics, we can get started. Um, Rebecca, I'm not sure if you'd prefer to 
start with the audience questions here. Well, since, we, you know, I have a bunch of questions, but since we only have five minutes uh, and we have just a few questions from the audience, um, I'd like to, why don't we start with them? Um, I guess the first one I'd like to start with is, uh, is uh, really, I'm not sure who, who to direct this to. Um, it's a little bit of uh, maybe uh, John and a little bit of Dan, you know, what, what do you think are the most realistic scenarios for heat recovery and retrofits? You know, we know that retrofits are difficult to do. I can't imagine how difficult the NYCHA ref retrofit was, but could you talk a little bit about how, uh, maybe some scenarios where you think uh, a retrofit would make sense economically and, and engineering wise for heat recovery, building heat recovery? So, um, yeah, I'm working on a couple of projects that are, that are deep retrofits right now and so the the big deal that we're doing is we are we are retrofitting the building heating system uh so that it can use 95 degree water to heat the building and that sounds really ludicrous but it's actually very easy to do um it's basically using fan coils and you can use you can use a fan coil with 95 degree water to get 90 degree air out, which is plenty warm enough to do your heating. Once you're doing your heating with 95 degree water, there's lots of places to get 95 degree water. You know, any heat pump that's rejecting, that, that's doing cooling, that's rejecting heat is probably going to be making 95 degree water. Your chiller that's uh, making chill water is probably going to be rejecting heat to 95 degree water. So basically setting up your building cooling system so that it's rejecting that heat can be utilized uh, by the building heating system, which means retrofitting the heating system um, is a, a, a very uh, significant way to reduce the heating requirements uh, for the building. And if you're fortunate enough to have the opportunity for some thermal storage, that's going to make it even better. That's great. Thank you. Um, is anybody, another question from the audience, is anybody looking at uh, recovering waste heat from elevator rooms? Um, you know, currently air conditioning is used to cool elevator rooms, burning energy to get rid of ener energy. It's sort of a double loss. That's a great question. So any, anybody looking at that in particular? No, doesn't sound like it. Um, let me ask a question. Um, a question from uh, from uh, the Miami uh, at the University. You had a, a 600% efficiency, you know, improvement. Can you and a COP of seven? Can you just tell us what the basis of that was a little in a little more detail? Sure. It's so if if you look at a steam boiler system, it has a COP of a 0.65, right, of the system, not the burner. The burner has okay. a COP of a 0.85. When you look at the heat pump uh, in simultaneous mode, so your work going into the compressor, the electric to spin the compressor, is used on the uh, condenser and the evaporator. So the work out is two times, right? Because you're you got it's additive, mm -hmm. plus the evaporator work is being done while your input's still the same. So you. COP is a seven and um, six, COP is six is actually generous. Yeah. We're, we're probably closer to a COP of seven. Great. They say it's 600 times more efficient than a 0.65. That's great. Um, can, uh, Mike, maybe you could, talk, you could talk about this. You've got a great graphic uh, of the uh, well field at the Ontario Tech. And uh, with such a density field, is there not a large D rate to wells in the center of that field versus those wells that are on the exterior? And even with spacing, um, it, let's see, even with spacing, uh, the ground, I imagine the ground mass in the center of the field is more affected by rejection or abstraction. Uh, audience question, could you address that? Yes, I don't have the specific stats of what their yield is, but but uh, certainly that would be a result over long time operation. Um, the 
the expectation is, is that we're going for the average temperatures and, and, and we're going, there's uh, uh, below grade and below frost uh, headers that are bringing in there. And so we're, we're as a reverse return implemented system, you're gonna end up with an average uh, supply to return temperature from each header system that comes in uh, into the building. But uh, they're able, as mentioned, to get uh, sustained uh, temperature differential that is giving a yield uh, that has helped them over a span of just uh, three to four years see the return on investment in comparison with the, if they had continued with the standard conventional costs for heating and cooling. Hey, Rebecca, I can uh, elaborate on that a little bit. So at Epic Corporation, we actually have 7,000 vertical bores. So it's very, right, compact. Yeah, yeah. 7,000 vertical borders takes up a lot of land. Well, we put uh, fiber optics down multiple vertical heat exchangers. We measure the temperature every foot down to 500 feet. And we actually have wells in between four heat exchangers. So what we're trying to do is measure the heat influx. How does how do, if you look at the pattern of four bores, and if you've got one right in the middle, okay, how do the four bores influence the temperature right in the middle, right? So there's actually white papers written by the University of Wisconsin that's doing all the research on this campus. Uh, we have, I believe, 10 test bores around, we got test bores on the perimeter to see if the energy is leaving the field, and then also how does the middle of the field, if it's heating up or, or not. So Jim Tingen, the professor at UW-Madison, Wisconsin, has been doing research there for about five years now and gathering all this data, and it's really interesting data. Well, that's great. Um, well, there are a few more questions. I've got a bunch, but we're at 11 o'clock. We're at a little past 11. So uh, I want to thank you all very, very much. That was just a great, great panel, and I uh, hope everybody learned a lot out in the audience. I know I did. Um, and Ellen and uh, Caitlin, should I turn it back over to you now? Yes, thank you so much, Rebecca, and thanks to everyone um, for joining today. Um, we really appreciate your time. Thanks for everybody who stuck with us too over these last couple minutes. Um, and for anyone who's still here, I did just want to mention quickly, one second. Um, we just had some upcoming events. Can everybody? Yeah. Um, just that uh, tomorrow we have Emerging Professionals uh, Drinks and Dialogue from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, and then the holiday member reception for Urban Green members is December 3rd. And then on December 8th, we're doing an event about the Great Energy Disconnect, which is really about um, people's uh, in the capacity um, that buildings have uh, had low capacity of people in them and how the energy has not shifted that much. And we're gonna explore that topic a little bit. Um, but that is all I had. So thank you all again. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.